Hi, it's Dwyer of DwyerCrime.blog. Today is Saturday, June the 25th, 2022. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let me also point out that DwyerCrime.blog is available at DwyerCrime.blog, free of cost. We also can be found on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, as well as on Amazon's podcast service. Again, all free of cost. I made an earlier video, and I take these videos quite seriously. At the time, a woman named Dana Chandler was in prison convicted of a double homicide. And in the earlier video, I made the argument that the prosecution simply didn't have any evidence to warrant the conviction, that the case should never have been brought, that Dana Chandler should never have been convicted. Well, I'm pleased to report that because of her excellent lawyers and because of the absence of evidence in the case, uh, in my opinion, uh, but mainly because of prosecutorial misconduct, which we'll discuss in this video, Dana Chandler has been granted a new trial. That trial is scheduled to take place later this year. Let's hope the state of Kansas does the right thing and either drops the charges, and I believe this is a case where the charges should just be summarily dropped, or works out a deal where she is able to walk free. Now let's talk about the level of prosecutorial misconduct. This is a case that really impacts all of us because the system cannot work when prosecutors engage in unethical behavior and lie to juries, right? The juries end up then relying on the lies and doing things like convicting people for double homicides when there's little to any evidence. Now, the prosecutor in this case has been disbarred that's how bad it was, folks, and can no longer practice law. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to refer to the court's opinion, and I'm going to refer to paragraph numbers in the court's opinion. So if there are any law school students out there or people who just enjoy, like I do, reading these court opinions, you will know where to look to investigate further the points I've raised in this video. Now let's just talk about the court's findings. Just understand, the court found that the prosecutor in Dana Chandler's case in which she was convicted of a double homicide did not show competence, did not show or present meritorious claims and contentions, did not show candor toward the tribunal, did not show fairness to the opposing party and counsel, did not properly participate in bar admission and disciplinary matters, right? engaged in outright misconduct. Now, Let's just give background on the case. Dana Chandler was married to a man who we will call MS, right, by his initials. That's how the court refers to him in this decision. And Dana, like many people engaged in a divorce, had a contentious divorce, right? The personalities didn't mesh the there was a lot of emotion. The divorce was contentious. 
After the divorce, MS then starts a new relationship with a woman we will call KH, as she is referred to in the court's opinion. Now I'm going to read from the court's opinion, paragraph 38. Right during the afternoon hours of July 7th, 2002, MS and KH were found dead in KH's Topeka home from gunshot wounds. Now this is according to the court, folks. In the disciplinary matter in which they disbarred the prosecutor. There was no evidence of a burglary. There was no evidence that anything was missing from the home. KH was wearing jewelry, MS's wallet containing more than $950 in cash was in his shorts and KH's purse containing more than $350 in cash was on the kitchen counter. A sliding glass door leading into the house from the back was ajar. The gun was never recovered, and no fingerprints were found on the empty shell casings or elsewhere at the scene of the crime. Paragraph 39. At the time of the murders, Chandler lived in Denver, Colorado. Later, Chandler moved to Oklahoma. Paragraph 40. In July of 2011, Chandler was charged with two counts of premeditated first-degree murder. Now, let me, my words here, just assert here that to make up for the clearly weak, I would argue, non-existent evidence against Dana Chandler, and let me just pivot and repeat that there's, according to the court, no sign of a burglary, no fingerprints, no murder weapon. Right? You can imagine. There really is no evidence in this case. Well, to make up for the lack of evidence, the prosecutor invented an imaginary protection from abuse order, one that the divorce court never issued. The argument was that Dana Chandler was a dangerous, scorned woman upset that her ex-husband had moved on, so much so that the court had to issue a protection from abuse order to keep her away from him. Now, let me just make a distinction. At the beginning of a divorce case, at least here in California, the court will issue what's called automatic temporary restraining orders. These are standard in divorce cases. What they say is that you can't move assets and you can't physically assault the other person, right? Let's keep this respectful. Let's keep this professional. What the prosecutor here was arguing is different. She was arguing that in the final divorce decree, there was a determination that Dana Chandler was so dangerous that the court had to issue a protection from abuse order. Let's read paragraph 52 of the court's decision disbarring the prosecutor. During the respondent's closing statement to the jury, and this is the prosecutor, right? She argued, how else do we know the defendant is guilty? M.S., the husband, got a protection from abuse, a court order. He applied and said, hey, judge, please order this woman to stay away from me. And the judge agreed. By the way, these are comments to the jury. Right? And in 1998, meaning one year after he filed for the divorce, he was continuing to have problems 
with the defendant, not leaving him alone. So we got a court order saying she has to stay away. The protection from abuse order did not stop the defendant, though. Again, the respondent displayed a slideshow. The slideshow included slides that stated, How else do we know the defendant is guilty? MS got a protection from abuse court order keeping defendant away from him in 1998. And how else do we know the defendant is guilty? The PFA, protection from abuse, did not stop defendant. Let me continue on to paragraph 57. Upon additional questioning by members of the Supreme Court, this is at her disciplinary proceeding. However, the respondent ultimately conceded that there was no document. Let me repeat that. No document evidencing a restraining or protective order in evidence. After multiple questions by the Supreme Court regarding the statements in her closing arguments relating to the existence of a restraining or protective order, the respondent finally clarified, I don't want to mislead this court. There is no document that I found in States Exhibit 969, which was the divorce file. There's no document in that file that is either a protection from abuse or a protective order. So if I indicated that there was a document, I don't want to mislead you. I do know speaking with the victim's family members that the order existed. Um, and that was discovered by Detective Volpe as the lead detective in this case. This is a jaw dropper. Folks, this isn't just a murder case. It's a double murder case. The prosecution is telling you that she has exhibits prepared, right? Slides that say, how else do we know the defendant is guilty? That refer to a protection from abuse order that she never introduces into evidence and can't find. This is simply outrageous. Outrageous. Understand, too, no such order exists. So in a case with very weak evidence, no murder weapon, no fingerprint, right, very weak evidence, the prosecution here is relying on an imaginary court order, which is never shown the jury. Let me continue. We move to paragraph 67. This is a paragraph that refers to the disciplinary proceeding against the prosecutor. Understand, too. This is a very serious matter if you're interested in justice because Dana Chandler was convicted and was in jail when all of this is happening. Right? This prosecutor got the conviction in a country that prides itself on the Declaration of Independence. Dana Chandler was being denied her freedom. Right? I have to tell you, as a divorce attorney, there are many divorces that are contentious. Also, and this prosecutor was female, but I want people to also consider the blatant sexism here. Right? Dana Chandler is supposed to be some dangerous, scorned woman who can't leave her ex-husband alone. I believe the prosecutor in this case is playing on stereotypes. So here she is now at her disciplinary proceeding, 
right? It had to happen because how do you get a murder conviction where you're referring to protection from abuse orders that don't exist? You even make slides that refer to the protection from abuse order that doesn't exist. Your case is that the defendant is dangerous, right? You can't quite tie the defendant to the crime itself. You can't say, oh, here's a fingerprint. Oh, the gun was her gun, right? Here are witnesses who recognized her at the scene of a double homicide. You don't have any of that. So here... The argument is, oh, she's dangerous. The divorce was contentious. She wouldn't leave her ex-husband alone. Her ex-husband had a new girlfriend. That must have been a trigger point. Right, folks? In my opinion, none of this is substantial evidence. So at her disciplinary proceeding, as reflected in the court opinion at paragraph 67, the respondent testified on her own behalf at the disciplinary hearing for the first time. Let me repeat that. For the first time, the respondent acknowledged that she introduced no evidence that a restraining order was in effect at the time of the murders. She testified, and I can't tell you as I sit here today that the restraining order exists. Since the, the, since you filed the complaint against me, I went looking and I can't find it. Folks, this, this is astonishing. Someone's been convicted of a double homicide. We can't have our judicial system operate like this. This is an outrage. Sadly, it doesn't end there. The prosecutor also makes up an imaginary telephone conversation between the defendant and her ex-husband. The prosecutor wants you to believe that she knows what was said in the telephone conversation. So, paragraph 73 of the court's decision, disbarring the prosecutor. On July 5th, 2002, two days prior to the murders, Chandler called MS seven times. One of the phone calls lasted five minutes. Paragraph 74, during opening statement of Chandler's jury trial, the respondent alleged that during the five-minute phone call, MS told Chandler that he was engaged to marry KH. The respondent implied that news of the engagement prompted Chandler to travel to Kansas and murder MS and KH two days later. Paragraph 80. During the oral argument, the Supreme Court questioned the respondent about her argument to the jury that MS informed Chandler of his engagement to KH during the five-minute phone call. In response to a question by Justice Johnson, the respondent asserted, we know exactly what happened during that phone call because MS told his brother, TS, I'm gonna get married to KH and I'm afraid of what that news will do when I tell Chandler because I'm afraid of what she'll do. Further, in response to a question by Justice Bayer, the respondent confirmed her position that T.S. testified about the substance of the discussion between M.S. and Chandler during the five-minute phone call. Paragraph 81. Upon further questioning by the Supreme Court, the respondent abandoned her argument that T.S.'s testimony established that Chandler learned of the engagement in the five-minute phone call. Then they have in parentheses here, at the disciplinary hearing, the respondent agreed 
that T.S.'s testimony did not establish the substance of the five-minute phone call. Folks, this is simply outrageous. Simply outrageous. Understand, at no time does T.S. hear what's said in the phone call. He's not tapped in on another phone. Not only that, if you listened closely to paragraph 80, MS doesn't tell T.S. that he told Dana Chandler that he was getting married. Rather, he tells his brother, hey, I'm worried how she's going to react when I tell her. Right, folks, this evidence is speculation by the prosecutor here as to what was said in the five-minute phone conversation, which was one of a number that the two people had that day. Right, folks, you cannot make bold statements to a jury about what was said in a conversation between a man who's no longer with us and the defendant who certainly did not tell this prosecutor, yes, he told me he was getting married and I was livid. This is a prosecutor reaching at straws. Let's continue. The prosecutor further, in trying to link a woman who lived in another state to a crime that took place in Kansas makes up an alleged escape route that Dana Chandler is supposed to have used in driving away from the crime scene. Right? Makes it up. Prosecutors are supposed to present evidence to juries. Not speculative fictional accounts of what might have happened. So, we get to paragraph 82. During her opening statement, the respondent stated that the state's evidence would show, and she sang this to the jury, the defendant's actual route included that she went from Denver to Topeka, MS and KH's house, and after killing both MS and KH, in an interest to get out of the state as quickly as she could, she drove directly to Nebraska. After she gets to Nebraska, she turns around and goes home, heading towards Denver. This route matches the defendant's gas purchases and the defendant's gas consumption by her credit card receipts. It is the only route that matches that she's attributed to, meaning what we know she bought in gas is not consistent with what she told Detective Volpe she did. It is not consistent with what she told they have in brackets, JB, she did the weekend of the murder. Paragraph 84. During the balance of the trial, the respondent put on no evidence. Let me repeat that. No evidence. This is the court at her disciplinary proceeding. Let me back up and repeat this first sentence. Paragraph 84. During the balance of the trial, this is after opening statement. The respondent put on no evidence to establish that Chandler drove through Nebraska to return to Colorado. Paragraph 85. Again, this is the court at the prosecutor's disciplinary proceeding. Later, during the respondent's rebuttal closing argument, 
the respondent made an additional reference to the Nebraska exit theory. What these two gas cans do match up with is it gives her enough fuel to get from Denver to Topeka to do the killing and to get out of the state. That's the significance of the gas cans. Otherwise, her 27 mile per gallon can't be done. Well, let me just say, this is a travesty. A complete travesty. This prosecutor makes up a court order. Just flatly makes up a court order that when pressed by the court at a disciplinary proceeding, she has to admit she doesn't have, can't find. Right? Now keep in mind, while she never presents the protection from abuse order to the jury, she specifically refers to it in the slides that she shows the jury. Then, of course, we get the contents of a five-minute phone call where she's speculating about what was said in the phone call. She has to admit that her source on what was said didn't have enough information to support what she said to the jury about that alleged phone call. Then, of course, she looks at the gas used in Dana Chandler's car, and she makes up a multi-state escape route because she understands if that route wasn't used, then it's impossible for Dana Chandler to have done the crime. There simply isn't enough gas. But understand, she has no evidence that this route was used. There are other problems inherent in the case. I see the video has already gone 27 minutes. Let me just say that the prosecution doesn't have fingerprints, doesn't have the murder weapon, doesn't have an eyewitness who can say with any certainty, I saw this woman at the murder scene. Understand, the evidence here is so scarce. The prosecution is going to have a problem even placing Dana Chandler in the state where the murder took place. It's not enough. It simply is not enough to say that a party was in a contentious divorce with one of the murder victims. Let me point out, too, that we're assuming that someone who knew the husband committed the murders. Why are we making that assumption? Weren't two people killed? Wasn't the husband and his new girlfriend killed? Why aren't we looking at the girlfriend's background? Understand, all it takes is one disgruntled person. One disgruntled person to go in and kill two people. Why does the person have to be from the guy's side of the ledger? Finally, doesn't this look like a professional hit to you? Right? The prosecution has nothing. Right? Understand. No fingerprints. Even though we're hearing about a sliding glass door. Right? They're shot. No one hears the shots. The gun not recovered. Even the empty shell casings have no fingerprints on them. 
Why does the prosecution believe that the ex-spouse pulled this off from out of state? Right, think about it. No one sees her, no one sees her vehicle. Their reference is to gas usage, but even the prosecution concedes that certain routes would have to be taken for the trip to even be possible from out of state. And the prosecution doesn't have evidence that those routes were taken. So the prosecutor has been disbarred. In the retrial, I don't know what the state of Kansas can put forward. What should really concern you is I first learned about this case on a TV show, uh, watching a TV show. It was either Dateline or 48 Hours, where they had a family member who strongly suspected that her mother, Dana Chandler, did the killing. But of course, you and I know family relationships are complicated. Sometimes kids or nieces or nephews have their own idea of what happened and they really don't fully understand the truth. Right? Sometimes there are agendas that they feel might align with someone who's been killed. Maybe they've heard misinformation. Maybe they have taken sides during a divorce. Let's be smarter than that. Right, folks? The forensic evidence here is pretty much non-existent. The prosecution's case was based on imaginary court orders, imaginary telephone conversations, imaginary escape routes, interstate. There's not enough here to maintain a successful prosecution for a double homicide. Saying an ex-wife was upset that a former husband had moved on isn't enough to link that wife to his murder in another state. This is outrageous. I will put a link to my prior video on this case that discusses the facts a little bit more heavily in the comment section of this YouTube video, and I'll try to embed it as well in the comment section on the other podcast sites where my videos post. Let me hear from you. I'm openly rooting for Dana Chandler, in the retrial, I think it's a tragedy that she spent as long as she had, it's been several years, folks, in prison for a crime there simply is no evidence of her ever committing. Right? Understand, too. I get the idea that prosecutors are passionate and they want convictions. The prosecutors need to make sure that they have the evidence on which to get a conviction. You can't start making up things in front of the jury. Here, that costs the prosecutor her law license. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. If you have evidence that leads you to believe that Dana Chandler did this crime, or if you have evidence of other prosecutorial misconduct, and let me point out that this prosecutor engaged in misconduct in other cases, right? At one point in this case, the judge who knew the prosecutor said to the prosecutor, I don't want you pointing to anyone in the gallery. And of course, the prosecutor then proceeded to motion to someone in the gallery. Right? Understand, this prosecutor was way over the line, and it cost her. Let me hear from you. Thank you for stopping by.